maybe none of the above. I'm Michael Smirkanish in Philadelphia with eight months to go before the first presidential ballot of 2024 is cast. The conventional wisdom is that we're headed for a rematch of 2020. This despite concerns that one candidate is too old and the other is morally unfit, which might explain why recent polls have also revealed that Americans don't want this rematch and that there's dissatisfaction with both candidates. Last month, an NBC poll found that 70 percent of respondents said Biden shouldn't run and 60 percent said Trump shouldn't run. So what are the odds that when all is said and done, the Democrats nominate someone other than Joe Biden and Republicans select a candidate different than Donald Trump? Back on April 16, I put a polling question to my Sirius XM radio audience asking them if they agreed with this statement. Neither Biden nor Trump will be their party's 2024 nominee. More than 35 percent of 20,000 plus who voted, they agreed with that statement. Maybe my listeners are on to something. This week, Emmy-winning TV journalist Bernard Goldberg wrote in a column for The Hill the following. Suddenly, a Biden-Trump rematch doesn't seem so inevitable. Goldberg writes, Republicans want a candidate who believes Trump really won in 2020, but Democrats want a candidate who can beat Donald Trump. If Biden doesn't look like that guy, the people behind the curtain who've been calling the shots in the White House, they may convince him that it's time to go. He cites the recent ABC News Washington Post poll in which Trump beats Biden head to head and then adds, while Donald Trump is way out ahead of his rivals, both announced and those likely to get into the race, it's still early. If he loses more court battles, gets hit with a few more indictments or a few more scandals emerge, anything is possible. Goldberg then concludes, we may not be locked into a Trump v. Biden 2.0 after all. Maybe in a country of more than 330 million people, we can do better than two senior citizens hauling a lot of baggage. Maybe Americans are ready for a change. Of course, to quote the old political adage, you can't beat somebody with nobody. And thus far, most prominent Republicans and Democrats, other than Biden and Trump, are sitting it out. Maybe early showings by two outsiders will cause them to rethink their reluctance. Two weeks ago, I interviewed Democratic challenger Robert F. Kennedy Jr. here on CNN. Our conversation followed a Fox poll showing him at 19 percent among Democrats. On the Republican side, the only candidate besides Trump polling in double digits, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, has yet to even announce his candidacy, and already he's shedding some support from voters and from donors. And then there's my next guest. Axios recently called 37-year-old biotech multimillionaire turned GOP candidate Vivek Ramaswamy the next Trump, younger and to the right. He's already polling the same as former Vice President Mike Pence, which again shows appetite for fresh faces, especially in the context of worries about Biden's age and Trump's legal entanglements. Forbes estimates that Ramaswamy has an estimated net worth of $630 million. He's already spent $10 million of that on ads and campaign trips, and he vows to spend as much as $100 million. He's written books, he's given speeches against critical race theory, big tech censorship, and stakeholder capitalism. He's never held elective office, then again, neither did Trump. Trump himself, citing the polls showing Ramaswamy tied with Mike Pence in third place, posted on Truth Social last week, quote, I am pleased to see that Vivek Ramaswamy is doing so well in the most recent Republican primary poll. The thing I like about Vivek is that he only has good things to say about President Trump and all that the Trump administration has so successfully done. This is the reason that he's doing so well. Politico reporting that former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski has spoken with a super PAC backing Ramaswamy about coming aboard with Trump's blessing. Neither RFK Jr. nor Ramaswamy has ever run for office before, but if these newcomers can so quickly cause ripples, it makes me wonder what more seasoned Pauls might be thinking and whether a year from now, when voting is underway, if everything will have changed and that it's not Biden versus Trump, it's neither Biden nor Trump. Joining me now is Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, thanks for being here. So you're running against Trump. Lead off by giving me an area of sharp disagreement that you have with the former president. My area of sharp disagreement is that I think we need to stop running from something and start running to something as a conservative movement. I think the left will give you the narrative of race, gender, sexuality, climate. My vision is grounded on the individual, family, nation, God, in the tradition of Reagan, I think we can both go further with America first, 
but also unite the country in the process. And so I'm touching issues that Trump didn't touch. I've pledged to end affirmative action in America. The president can do that by executive order because it was created by executive order. I don't just talk about building some wall. I'm putting the military on the southern border to end the border crisis and, by the way, the fentanyl problem as well. I'm not just going to put Betsy DeVos on top of the Department of Education. I've said that agency shouldn't exist. I will shut it down and give that money to families across the country to actually have choice in where they send their children to school. But in many ways, Michael, here's the trick. I think we can at once go further with the America First agenda, but also unite the country rather than divide it. If we're doing it based on first principles and moral authority, that's what I'm bringing to the table. I know that you're familiar with what went on here on CNN Wednesday night with the town hall, even though you were preoccupied with a campaign event of your own. I'm going to put on the screen and just read aloud a couple of the things that came from that event. Donald Trump, he refused to admit that he lost the 2020 election. He called E. Jean Carroll a whack job. He vowed to pardon January 6 rioters, dodged questions about federal abortion ban and wouldn't say if he wanted Ukraine to win the war. Is there anything that I've just articulated that you disagree with? So, look, I will be more explicit than Trump was. I don't believe a federal abortion ban makes any sense. I say this as somebody who is pro-life. This is not an issue for the federal government. It is an issue for the states. I think we need to be explicit about that. If murder laws are handled at the state level and abortion is a form of murder, the pro-life view, then it makes no sense for that to be the one federal law. So it seems like Many other Republicans are dancing around that issue and afraid to say it out loud. I will. I'm not rooting for Russia to win this war against Ukraine, but I'll also be clear about how I'll end it diplomatically, not by actually sending more money to Ukraine. I think we've done too much of that, but it's by leading diplomatically, something that this White House has long missed. The same White House that is sending money to Ukraine is also lobbying the EU against its ban on Russian oil imports, financing Putin's war machine. That makes no sense. I think we can bring Germany to the table to step up to actually defend European interests rather than America to step up and do it instead. They're stop using export controls to stop Poland. So I think leading diplomatically, I think being clear about answers, that's where I differ not only from Trump, but from the rest of the field. Vivek, I I know I heard you say that you're not rooting for for Russia to win the war. God, I would hope not. Are you implying that Trump is rooting for Russia to win the war? And why not just flat out say you're rooting for Ukraine to win the war? Well, first of all, I, I would, like, exactly as you said, I don't represent where any, any of the other candidates in this field stand. What I think we actually need in the Republican Party is more clarity. Where are you on the issue? Where aren't you? So I'm clear on that. I would not send another dollar of U.S. resources to Ukraine. You can, Ukraine can pursue a Ukraine first agenda. Poland can pursue a Poland first agenda. Germany can pursue a Germany first agenda. But I think the failure is Germany is now getting in Poland's way. So that's where I am on the position on the Ukraine wars. I don't think it directly relates to American interests. Therefore, I don't want to use American resources that we could instead use on actual policies that affect Americans here at home, such as using our military to secure our own border instead of somebody else's. But I'm clear about that. That's not because I'm rooting for Russia or rooting for one angle or another on the war. It's because I believe that I look at what matters for American interests when I'm looking. Okay, at but I just, I just, I, I just want to, I just want to be clear. I've given you ample opportunity to flat out say <laughs> you want Ukraine to win the war. You're for Zelensky, not Putin, and you've not, you've not taken that invitation. So look, I, I think that this is, not a two, this is not a two-sided tug of war for me. To me, this is a question of how do we have peace in a way that also respects national boundaries and most importantly deters Putin from going after a NATO ally. So what does winning and losing define exactly what that means, Michael? And I can tell you what, what outcome I'd like to see. The outcome I'd well, like to okay, see is one how about that this? Re- I'd reflects like, boundaries. I, I, I'll I'll try. I'd like at a minimum to go back to where we were a year, I guess by now, 14 months ago. Like Putin ought to get out of wherever he was in a year and a half. I think that would be a great outcome. I think that would be a great outcome. Okay, let let me let me let me move on. So you have proposed raising the voting age from 18 to 25 for those unless they engage in service or can pass a civics examination. And you were a guest of mine on Sirius XM. And some of my callers then said, why is he targeting the youth when a lot of older Americans probably could not pass the naturalization exam? So, look, I think it's best to start fresh with the next generation of Americans. So the constitutional amendment that I've expressed support for is to raise the voting age from 18 to 25, but still allow 18 year olds to vote 
if they at least pass the same civics test required of naturalized citizens, or they perform at least six months of military service, or at least six months of first responder service, such as in the police. This is not an unfamiliar notion, Michael. And I'll tell you two things about this. In 1971, when we lowered the voting age to 18 in the first place, that was in the context of actually the military draft. That was the whole justification in the first place for making the voting age 18 at all. And then in addition to that, we already have selective service mandated. People forget this in the U.S. for adult men between the ages of 18 and 25. That exists today. Every adult male, if they're following the law, has to do it already. So I'm building on already familiar intuitions, instincts already based into our history and even the current law to say, how are we going to revive I'm, civic pride in the next generation, which is one of my top I'm, concerns, I'm all Michael. For I know. And, and I and by the way, I applaud you for that in terms of civics need to be reintroduced. By the, we, we have a uh, uh, someone else who agrees with us. Oddly, Richard Dreyfus, who's written a whole book on the subject. Vivek, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. You'll come back. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. What are your thoughts? Hit me up on social media. I'll read some responses.